I wanna preach today about revival. Um, with all that's happened in our world and in the last few weeks, last few months, but even more than that, in the last few years, I just believe the church is in need of revival. And I am not talking about like just shouting louder. I'm not talking about pumping up the volume in our singing. I believe there'll be an emotional expression in revival, but that's not what we're aiming for. We're aiming for God to revive his church, and we desperately need revival. Uh, revive, or the word revival is, comes from a Latin word meaning when that which was almost dead lives again, to rekindle the flame like from a spark and have a, a flame going again, that which is dying out to live again. And I'm just believing that now more than ever, the church needs to be uh, revived. I believe our contribution to society right now is more than good marches, it's more than better laws, it's more than conversations with our neighbor that are all good. I believe our contribution right now is to say to this world, we are gonna pray and we are gonna pray. We are gonna bombard heaven and say we want to see revival. We wanna see a, a world that needs Jesus find Jesus and real healing and real hope be restored. God has to revive his church. Right now, we need to have a restored passion. We need our, our healing in our land. We need Jesus. And I'm so glad that, that we can pray for this and believe for this because what I see right now is a sad situation. Nationally, when I see the church, I see a church that is sleepy and unmoved and uninvolved and is marginalized and it's absent. It's almost content to be a social club or a gathering or a partner uh, for social services. And I'm saying like, it, it, it's done. We, we can't be singing from rote like, yeah, yeah, go on to the next thing. We can't be sitting around critiquing sermons. We've gotta be applying them to our life and living them out. We can't be yawning about the mission and just being like, there we go again. It's gotta be a fire that's burning in our hearts again. And I'm praying, God, don't let us miss our moment. Don't let us miss our moment. This is a moment like this is what the church was made for. This is a, a moment where we're saying, God, help us to be the salt and the light. Jesus said this about the church. He said we would be the salt and the light. And in Matthew 5, 13, he says, you're the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Salt was highly valued in that day and to be called the salt of the earth. If somebody's ever said that about you, that's high praise because salt had a component of purity and it meant that it was pure and the church has gotta be pure again. We've gotta search our hearts and say, it's time for us to be pure again. We've let the world stain us in so many different ways and it's time to say, God, help us to be pure. The, the salt is a preserving agent. Salt for us, us today is, is putting on something that makes it taste better, but in the Bible days, and if you've been to other countries, you'll see that salt is a preserving agent. And when you put salt on meat that has been cut up, it keeps it from rotting, and we are to be the salt of this earth to help this world to not rot away, and what we're seeing right now is an accelerated rotting. Uh, one commentary says this, we are like a cleansing antiseptic in society. Our very presence is to defeat corruption. It's to defeat corruption and make it easier for others to be good, and I'm afraid the church in America has lost its way. We've lost our saltiness, and like Jesus says, if you lose the saltiness, are you good for anything anymore? If the church isn't gonna be salty in a good way in purity and preserving, we're missing our moment, we're missing our mission. And our prayer right now is like physical revival. Physical salt can't be salty again, but the church can get salty again. The church can find its way again. The church can be revived. Pastor Leonard Ravenhill said this, and this man was a man of God. I was around him. I had an opportunity to hear him preach and be in a couple settings with him. Incredible. He said, the only reason we don't have revival is because we are willing to live without it. And I'm not willing to live without it. I'm not. I look at the, the church right now, and we need revival. J.I. Packer, another preacher, he said, revival is the visitation of God which brings to life Christians who have been sleeping and restores a deep sense of God's near presence and holiness. Then springs a vivid sense of sin and a profound exercise of heart in repentance, 
praise and love with an evangelistic outflow. I love that. We need revival. And I'm saying, God, do it again. Do it again. I have never been a part of a revival on a national level. I've been a part of a church revival and and different things in school. We had different revivals. But I wanna see God do it again in our nation and in this world. People still talk about the Welsh revival from 1905 and they just talk about how great it was and they have family members that told them how great it was. And some of you might be thinking, I don't know if USA can do it. I don't know if our country, if our world can do it, like if God can do it in this moment. And I say, yes, he can. Yes, he can. I think about Isaiah chapter 66, verse eight, and the prophet Isaiah was saying, who's heard of such a thing? Who has seen such things? Can a land be born in one day or a nation be delivered in an instant? And I'm praying that our nation could be delivered in an instant. I'm praying that like what Isaiah was thinking there, that for us, 3,000 were added on the day of Pentecost. And I'm believing, why can't you do it again? You, You may not realize this, and this just hit me so strong this week. Our church movement that we're a part of with the Assemblies of God was born out of the Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles in about 1906. I have a picture here, I want them to put it up, of William J. Seymour. You wanna know who started this whole thing and got this thing rolling with our movement that our church is part of? This guy, William J. Seymour. He was the preacher that was going around and all of a sudden the presence of God fell in that Azusa Street Revival and, and it just birthed something in our nation. And this is what they said, Nearly unprecedented at the time was the way in which African Americans, Latinos, whites, and others worshiped together. I love that. One participant in the Azusa Street Revival named Frank Bartleman, he stated that during the revival, he said, the color line was washed away in the blood of Jesus. Make sure William's still up there. I want you to see that guy, William J.C. I mean, this was in 1906, before the Civil Rights Movement, the the son of former slaves was preaching and bringing revival of which our church is part of. And that's why I'm saying, God, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. The color line was washed away in the blood of Jesus. The church should be leading the way right now. And I'm saying, Lord, send a revival. We need a new outpouring. We need more of your spirit. And this needs to be our focus. This needs to be our focus going forward. Uh, We need to be praying, God, we need revival. We need revival. We need revival. And be praying and and asking God over and over again for this. And then we've got to ask ourselves, what can we do? What can we do? And I want to point out from the word of God here, and we're going to pray at the end of this, and we're going to have a song that is going to call us to revival. But there's things that we can do to position ourselves. And the first thing that when I see, when I look in the Bible and I see revival, I see the, the, the children of Israel, the Jewish people, God had chosen them to uh, represent him to the world. And they would wander away and they would come back and wander away. And in one of those moments that they wandered away and they needed to be revived again, God speaks to them in Zechariah chapter one, verse three. It says, therefore tell the people, this is what the Lord Almighty says, return to me, declares the Lord Almighty, and I will return to you, says the Lord Almighty. Do not be like your ancestors to whom the earlier prophets proclaim, this is what your Lord, the Lord Almighty says, turn from your evil ways and your evil practices, but they wouldn't listen or pay attention to me, declares Lord. He's like saying, don't be like previous generations. He's saying, return to me, and the first thing we need to do is return to God. We need to say, God, we desire you, we are hungry for you, we, we are returning to you, and in that, that requires repentance. It requires us to say, we have done things that have taken us away from true worship. We have done things that have have shown that we don't love you with our whole heart. We have done things that say we loved other things instead of you. And we're saying, God, we repent. We repent, we return. These people that Zachariah was talking to had 20 years to get things right. And they went around living their life and God's like, you haven't established worship. You haven't valued my manifest presence. You haven't made it a priority. You've just done your own thing. As he was speaking there and he's speaking to us now, we desire the manifest presence of God. We desire him to pour out his spirit on our church and we say we come back to God and that means we repent of the things that we have done, the stains of the world that have gotten on us and are part of us. We now say we repent and we come back to you, God. Secondly, which is very similar, we have to return to our first love. When I look at revival here, 
we get a glimpse in the spirit realm of, of Revelation chapter two. We get a glimpse into this. And, and the Lord is speaking to different churches and he's speaking to the church at Ephesus. And he says, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people, that you've tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them false. You have preserved and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary, yet I hold this against you. This is the church at Ephesus, he says. You have forsaken the love you had at first. You've forsaken your first love. Consider how far you've fallen. Repent, which means turn and come back. And do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand lampstand from its place. The church in Ephesus, it was the largest city in the region. It was ethnically diverse. It was very tolerant. It was very uh, tolerant of other things that were going on. And they left their first love. They grew lazy. They had no expectation, no passion. They had no drive. They're like, meh. Well, they were unmoved. And I, I, I just pray that our church and the church in America and the church in the world would not be just unmoved, but we'd want a fire there. We've had other interests that have crept in and we'd say, I want more of you, Lord. I want more of you. One evangelist said this, he said, revival is falling in love with Jesus all over again. And to that I say amen and amen. I wanna fall in love with Jesus all over again. Another thing we can do to position ourselves for revival, because we need revival. And if you're agreeing with me, you're like, I'm in, I'm in, I wanna do this. Another thing we can do is return to prayer. We've gotta pray, we've gotta pray, we've gotta pray. And if you have a prayer language, you gotta pray in the spirit. We have got to pray. In in Nehemiah, Nehemiah gets the word that he's a, a servant in another kingdom. He gets the word that Jerusalem, God's city, it, the walls are broken down, the temple's broken down, their worship isn't gone, and, and he prays, he weeps. Listen to what it says in Nehemiah chapter one, verse three. It says, they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He mourned, he prayed, he worshiped, he confessed, he fasted. This was like an effort. I wanna speak this out. This was all before he went to the government for help. This was all before that. We're shouting new laws, new laws, and we need new laws, but you know what? New laws will be broken by new lawbreakers. New laws will just tell us what's out of bounds, but unless God gets a hold of the heart, people aren't gonna change. People aren't gonna change. We need Jesus to change the hearts of people and we need to say, God, we will pray, we will seek you, we will weep, we will do this. Our world needs, world needs Jesus and we've gotta bring Jesus to this world. I mean, think about it. Some of us were terrible people. The Bible in, in 1 Corinthians chapter six talks about all this list, these list of sins and then the apostle Paul says, such were some of you. Like you used to do those things, but God changed you. And the only way to drive bigotry and and racism and and this hatred out of our country and just the division that's there is by the power of Jesus Christ. We can't, people say you can't legislate morality, but we can put where the guidelines are and people go outside them, but Jesus changes hearts. That's what happens. Our world needs Jesus. Another thing we can do is return to God's word and you say, yeah, 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 we'll read more. No, it's not that. It's, that's part of it, but it's more than just reading. It's reading God's word, but it's, it's, it's listening and obeying it and applying it, living it out. Much of our problem in losing our saltiness has been we've heard the word of God, we've consumed the word of God, we've heard sermons, but we're not applying it. We're not living it out in our day-to-day walk, and we've got to live it out. When the Bible says hear or listen, it's the word shema. And it's, 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 it's saying from God's point of view, listening and hearing equals obeying. That's why he says, you hear me, your ears are dull, you're not doing what I said. So when God says, hear what the word of the Lord says, read, th- let the word of God speak to you, it's living, it's alive. You don't just go, I'll take that under advisement. You say, I hear it, I obey it, I wanna do this, I wanna do this. This is what God's asking us to do. Fifth thing we can do is we can return to unity. In 
My next book is coming out on unity, and we've preached it. I have a previous sermon on it, moving at the speed of unity. You could go there again and recommit to say, God, I desire to have this unity. But in Acts chapter two, there is great unity. Acts chapter one, Acts chapter two, there's great unity that's going on. They're waiting for the power of Pentecost, and the Holy Spirit is poured out when they were all in one accord, when they were unified. In Acts chapter four, the church delivers care for people and shares their goods with each other because there's great unity going on. Ed Stetzer, he's a church uh, historian right now, and he says, a divided nation is a tragedy, but a divided church is a travesty. Man, remember Azusa, where our church heritage was birthed out of. The color lines were washed away in the blood of Jesus. They were together. There was a unity that blew the world away. We need to have unity, and I just, I gotta call this out for our church. There are some of our campuses, and they're fractured right now. They're fractured, and, and some of you are worshiping at a distance. You don't know, but I, I'm seeing some of our campuses. There's fractures, and there's schisms, and there's fighting. There needs to be forgiveness. There needs to be grace. There needs to be love. There needs to be apologies. There needs to be reconciliation. There needs to be a calling out and a crying out like, God, Forgive us, bring us back together. We don't take our ball and walk away and leave. We stay and we fight for unity, which sounds crazy. We fight for unity. We struggle for unity. We strive for unity. We desire, because if we want revival, the church can't be fighting with each other. Church, church has got to forgive and show the love of Jesus. Why would they ever want to join a fighting church? And so I'm calling out our campuses. I'm calling out our church. I'm saying for us, to forgive, to apologize, to reconcile, to love, to give it great amounts of grace. We've had COVID that has caused us to be separated and go to church, don't go to church, stay away. This, And we've been fighting with each other. We've had the, the volatility from America's history of racism being expressed today still in bigotry and prejudice that we see all around us. And there's not a United States feel. I said the other day that we feel like I have three different congregations. I feel like the United States feels like 50 different uh, states that are gonna turn into 50 different nations divided seven different ways, and God help us. It's time. It's time for the church to lead the way for revival. And lastly, when all this happens, there'll be a new passion for the task. It won't be, aren't we great, and let's all sit around and sing louder and shout louder. That energy of the Holy Spirit gets us back on the task. That energy gets us back to where all of a sudden the whole world, because in Acts 13 it talks like the whole world started here because there was this unity and they were back on mission again. And I'm, I'm praying for us to be living this out. I'm praying for us to say, God, we do this for your glory, for your honor. We're gonna bring people to faith and we're gonna cry out in prayer for revival. We wanna align and do these things for revival. That's what we want. It is the answer. I look at America, I look at our state, I look at our cities, and I say, what's the answer? It's not new laws. We will make new laws. It's not new laws, it's new hearts. It's changed hearts. It's the church leading the way, but we've gotta say, we desire revival. I'm gonna pray for revival. I have to continue to pray, and I'm asking you to pray. And I know there's been much made about getting on our knees lately, and I've only been on my knees for my Lord and Savior. I've only been on my knees I, I, I don't even think, if I remember, I don't even remember if I got on a knee to ask Becca to marry me, and uh, I didn't. I was sitting down, and she was sitting down. But I've been on my knees before God, and I've said, God, this is what I desire. It's a form of humility, and I'm calling for us in our campuses and in your living room or wherever you're watching this to take a moment to get on your knees and to cry out and to say, God, we need revival. I humble myself. I want you to search your heart and see what you need to do to repent. Say, God, as we turn from this, we turn to you. Forgive us for not putting you first. Forgive us for walking away from our first love. Forget us for being too busy to pray, to read and obey your word. For, forgive us for having it become head knowledge, but not hand living out, God. And then to be able to say, God, help us to be unified and then help us to be about the mission. It's time for us to pray for revival. And I'm asking as we sing this next song that we get on our knees, that we would call out to God, whether we're at church, in a campus, or in your living room, or in your home, that you would say, God, we desire, we desire revival. Revive your church again. Lord, do it again, do it again, do it again. Revive us in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen.